So welcome all to the Institute for Critical Study of Society, also known as ICSS. This institute was established in 2004 and was to support emerging struggles for socialism, towards which struggles for better working conditions with a living wage for all workers, racial and gender equality, freedom from state repression, an end to imperialist wars, and restoration of nature to a healthy condition, all are essential components. Before the COVID pandemic hit us, we used to hold our sessions at the Diebel Proctor Marxist Library, where the Institute was founded uh, in 2004. The members of ICSS are active in different aspects of uh, people's struggles in the Bay Area, the US and globally. We respect each other, but we do not necessarily agree on all matters. Accordingly, the opinions expressed in our lectures, workshops and publications are those of the participants. They do not represent any group consensus. However, we are united in our respect for the work of Karl Marx, and we believe his work remains relevant today. Karl Marx's 11th thesis on Feuerbach is what, is what his lifelong comrade Frederick Engels chose for the epitaph on Marx's grave in London. As you know, <laughs> Marx wrote a lot <clears throat> where Marx died in 1883 at the age of 65, and I would like to quote that. The philosophers have only interpreted, interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. And when we talk about workers who, as Marx taught us, create most of all that we need to live on, they have no country of themselves, of, of their own, except when, where they have one power. Workers in Canada, the US, China, Turkey, Iran, in fact, all over the world are brothers and sisters whom capital pits against each other to reduce their wages and live in a rapidly deteriorating environment in which global warming substantially created by the capitalist mode of production is the greatest danger facing humanity today. Our speaker today is someone who lives by Marx's inspiration. Dave McKee has been a political activist for over 30 years with experience in the Canadian labor movement. He lives in Toronto. The, uh, the, he has been active in the peace movement, the anti-poverty movement and international solidarity. Presently, Dave is a member of the Central Executive Committee of the Communist Party of Canada and editor of People's Voice, Canada's leading socialist publication. His topic today is working class environmentalism, which is the same heading uh, which he wrote, in which he wrote a heading of his article that was published in mltoday.com not so long ago, and which I read and I, I thought uh, I will ask him to come and speak in our session today. And I'm very grateful that he accepted it. Today's session as is a practice will, is being video, video recorded and will be posted on YouTube in the ICSS Marxist, ICSS Marx channel. Our speaker will take about 45 to 55 minutes, correct me if I'm wrong on that day, to present and then answer questions in the next hour after a brief intermission. So the formal session will end at 12.30. Uh, and uh, after that, for half an hour, there'll be informal uh, uh, conversation, uh, session going on. And Dave, of course, you are invited to stay on. But at that point, it is not very much we're, we're not as we let people speak freely, uh, not so structured. So with that said, please join me in welcoming 
Dave McKee to IS Sunday Forum. Dave, it's yours. Thank you very much, Raj. Nice introduction. And, and uh, I just want to start by saying thank you very much to all of you for the opportunity to participate in this forum. Um, I should tell you, I'm out on my porch here in Toronto and there is some traffic. So <laughs> hopefully it's not too noisy. If it is, just interrupt me and I'll go inside. It's just noisier inside. Um, so I, I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy to get to know the ICSS a little bit. Um, and uh, I hope that through the next couple of hours, I can get to know each of you a little bit too. Um, so this presentation, uh, as Raj said, emerged from uh, an article that I wrote in the spring. And that article was to mark, uh, it was part of our efforts to mark the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party of Canada. And I was attempting in that article to track the development of the party's policies um, and analysis towards the environment over the course of its 100 year history. So what I did is I, I looked at that development as having three broadly defined, what I call historical moments, that's maybe a bit pretentious, but um, I didn't want to use the term phases, that sounded a little too rigid. But these moments I identified as first um, a period where the focus uh, from roughly the 1920s till about the early 1970s, where the focus was really on agitating for what I call environmental sovereignty as a vehicle for economic development in Canada. Uh, the second moment, which uh, was largely, I would say, in the 1970s and 1980s, was recognition of the environment as its own area of concern and of the environmentalist movement as an organized social movement. And then <clears throat> the third moment that I, I identified was the current one, which is the development and promotion of a concentrated working class environmentalism. So while these different, uh, as I say, moments emerged at different times in party history, um, they're interrelated, the three, they're all interrelated and they're key, I think, to the forward propulsion of the Communist Party's ongoing and developing work on the environment. So I should maybe start by just saying what this presentation is not or what I don't intend it to be. So... It's, not, it's not an academic examination of Marxist theory relating to the environment. So I'm not combing through Marx's texts on things like species being or on alienation of nature. Um, and nor am I commenting on more of the recent uh, the uh, Marxist theoretical work like John Bellamy Foster's writing on metabolic rift. And I, I'm not at all trying to diminish that. I think theory is enormously important. Uh, and maybe, you know, maybe in the discussion, we'll get into some of that. It's just that it, that's not the point of departure that I used. My point of departure was specifically the concrete policies and analysis of the Communist Party. And so I guess we could think of it as more a look at tactics rather than theory to, to a degree, right? Um, there are sort of the backbone to my approach. Um, there are four, uh, I guess, theses which form that backbone. And the first is that the development of the Communist Party, and I mean Communist Party of Canada, the Communist Party, the development of the Communist Party's analysis and policies on the environment is largely res reflective of the development of the same within the labor movement in, in my country. And this is by virtue of the party's connection with and attention to the labor movement. And I would add to that, that since the Communist Party of Canada has for its entire existence maintained an active connection with communist and workers parties around the world, I'm assuming that to a large, although not complete degree, the development of communist party policies in Canada are reflective to the same, uh, to that development among parties and working classes in other countries. Uh, largely, but not completely. The second thesis that uh, is you know, in the background is that environmental destruction and particularly climate change have proceeded to the point that they pose an existential crisis to humanity akin to global nuclear war. Different, of course, but on that same, approaching that same scale. Uh, the third is that while environmental destruction did not begin with capitalism or end with the development of socialism, Capitalist expansion is the key driving force behind environmental destruction and climate change, which has now reached crisis levels. The fourth thesis is that socialism will not automatically resolve the environment or climate crisis, but it does provide the what I've called the societal platform for doing so. And this is a pl platform which capitalism, capitalism cannot provide. And related to this, 
as the key force for achieving that revolutionary change, the development of socialism, the working class must take up the issue of environmental security and climate justice in its own name. And this is what I will refer to as working class environmentalism. So this, this presentation is, is pretty, uh, pretty largely based on the article that I wrote. So if you've already read the article, you're gonna be perhaps a bit bored to hear it again. And I apologize for that. But what I'm gonna do though, is take you through some of the development of the analysis and policy within the CP of Canada, Communist Party Canada um, on the environment. And I think that that raises some important discussions when we discuss this question of working class environmentalism. And I'm, I, I really am looking forward to the discussion afterwards. I thought I'd start with just a, a little quote from the program of the Communist Party. Um, and and this, is, uh, this was updated in 2001. Uh, and the quote is, our planet is also reaping the harvest of centuries of subordinating nature to the blind play of capitalist market forces. Under capitalism, both labor and the national environment are subordinated to and exploited for capitalists overriding objective, which is surplus value or private profit. As a mode of production and consumption, capitalism has raised the degradation of nature to historically unprecedented levels. Only liberation from capitalism will open up new possibilities for a fundamental change in humanity's relationship with nature. So that's, that's just a, an excerpt from uh, our party's program. So environmentalism emerged, uh, I argue, as a consistent area of work in our party uh, and, and organizing in the last three decades, more or less. And I would say that in general, this mirrors the development of a large body of scientific analysis that has highlighted environmental destruction as an issue of mass public concern. And as I argued before, as an existential crisis presently. This is an area of political work that has seen tremendous changes in terms of the science around it and how par uh, Communist Party policy has developed in line with that. I think it is important to start out by noting that Marxists have long understood the link between capitalist expansion and environmental degradation. And there are, there are many quotes from the, the classic sources that we could, we could point to. The one that I, uh, or one of the ones that I like is Frederick Engels from uh, 1876. He wrote in the part played by labor in the transition from ape to man. He wrote, as individual capitalists are engaged in production and exchange for the sake of the immediate profit, only the nearest, most immediate results must first be taken into account. As long as the individual manufacturer or merchant sells a manufactured or purchased commodity with the usual coveted profit, they're satisfied and do not concern themselves with what afterwards becomes of the commodity and its purchasers. The same thing applies to the natural effects of the same actions. What cared the Spanish planters in Cuba who burned down forests on the slopes of the mountains and obtained from the ashes sufficient fertilizer for one generation of very highly profitable coffee, coffee trees. What cared they that the heavy tropical rainfall afterwards washed away the unprotected upper stratum of the soil, leaving behind only bare rock. In relation to nature as to society, the present mode of production is predominantly concerned only about the immediate, the most tangible result. So I just say that because, you know, as I say, it's one example of, of um, I think a, a pretty insightful um, uh, writing on by Marx and, and Engels and, and others, uh, other Marxists and, and revolutionaries around the environment, around nature. But I think it's also fair to say that it was only as material conditions caught up with that theoretical projection over the course of many decades of industrial activity that Communist Party and, and I, I would say the working class movement generally began to develop a focused analysis on the environment and incorporate that into its agitational and propagandistic work. So I mentioned previously that I see that development as having those three broadly defined moments, environmental sovereignty, recognizing the environment as its own area of concern, and then uh, a concentrated working class environmentalism. Um, and these emerged at different times, as I said, but they are interrelated. And I, I just want to underline that point that each of those moments has been built off of the preceding approach and the application of that approach in the specific change in concrete conditions. Uh, and I, I want to speak, just wanted to touch on that because this isn't a case as far as I can tell in which previous analyses and policies 
were rejected and replaced with radically different ones. Of course, there are debates. Uh, there's always debates about how to develop different policies, you know, which to how to prioritize them. But I think in the case of the Communist Party of Canada, this should generally be seen as the result of a rather consistent application of Marxism-Leninism to the material conditions, and then a scientific reflection upon the same. So that may not be super important to this talk, but I do think that that's, that's notable. So I'll talk about a little bit about this first sort of moment, this, this uh, focus on what I call environmental sovereignty. And so for the first several years of the Communist Party's existence in Canada, discussion and action around the environment were generally limited to or focused on natural resources and their relationship to economic development. Um, specifically, that work was guided by a demand for the nationalization of natural resources and resource industries as necessary measures for ensuring that economic growth would occur in a way that benefited the working class through wages, uh, you know, uh, decent benefits, uh, good prices for, um, uh, for materials, uh, et cetera. And in looking at this, I came across two articles from uh, what was the name, the, the party press at the time called the Daily Tribune. Uh, and they illustrate this approach and some of the issues behind it. So both of these articles are from 1947. I'm just going to describe them quickly. The first one is an analysis of provincial politics in the province of Alberta, uh, which you're probably familiar with, uh, more familiar with Canadian geography than, than I suspect. <laughs> I don't know how familiar you are with Canadian geography, but I'll just explain. So Alberta is in the west of Canada. It's... Uh, uh, home to uh, overwhelmingly to uh, the oil industry. And uh, there was a huge oil discovery at Leduc in Alberta. And, and this discovery really marked a turning point at which Canada moved away from being a net importer of oil to being a, a major exporter of oil. So it was just a, a massive discovery and it was followed up by others as well. At that time, Alberta had a really right-wing provincial government uh, the party was called the Social Credit Party. It governed from 1935, I think, till 1971. And its policies were rooted in right-wing populism, Christian fundamentalism, anti-Semitism, and xenophobia. And following this discovery at, at Leduc, the oil discovery, that government ensured through its policies that the benefits of the oil boom would flow to US corporations. It granted to those corporations extensive concessions of land, and in fact, the article in the Daily Tribune that I am referring to referred to those concessions as the most sweeping of the kind anywhere on the continent. And it also granted to those uh, corporations unfettered access to farmers' land in order to build wells, pipelines, and tanks, so farmers could not refuse. Um, this is actually still the case. The Alberta public received a very small royalty. It was about 12.5%, which is... Uh, roughly, you know, one out of every eight barrels of oil. And it also received minimal employment benefits because the oil corporations tended to look to the United States for its oil field workers and also for the manufactured uh, equipment. So the spin-offs and supporting industries. In response to this, the Communist Party uh, opposed the concession of public land and pressed for public ownership of the oil resource. The, the party worked on this both in its own name, but also through mass movements uh, like the Alberta Farmers Union. And the party also championed the rights of farmers to refuse access to oil on their lands. And it demanded fair compensation for those farmers who did allow such, uh, such access. And one of the things that I found really notable in this article from 1947 was uh, a statement that pointed to the negative effect that oil drilling and, and development had on the land itself, on farmland. And what it said was allowing for another 20 years of development work, agriculture in these areas will have to be terminated. That's a pretty, uh, I mean, it's a chilling comment, but it's also, you know, fairly sage, right? Because it's true. Uh, and that was, what, uh, 50, 60, 70 years ago almost. The second article from 1947, also from the Daily Tribune, was uh, not based in, not focused on Alberta. It was focused in Ontario, where I live, uh, which is in the sort of central Canada, or central east. 
Uh, and that was written by a, a lumber workers union leader who labor, later became a party leader in the province of Ontario named Bruce Magnuson. And he was critiquing, writing to critique uh, the report of a Royal Commission on Forestry in Ontario. And that commission, which is a uh, Royal Commission is sort of a silly term. Uh, this is basically a government report, right? Uh, and it recommended that the province's forestry industry be administered by several private corporations. Uh, and Magnuson actually described this case uh, in very similar terms to the situation in Leduc, Alberta. He said, investment capital and monopoly control have expanded very rapidly through the most reckless use of public resources and with a minimum of public control. We are therefore faced with two basic alternatives. One, either curtail the monopoly control and shameless destruction of our public resources by drastic action to regain effective public control and administration before it's too late, or two, permit private corporations to take complete charge and thus lose all avenues of public control. So these are sort of examples of, of how the, the Communist Party at the time uh, promoted this idea and fought for this idea of what I call environmental sovereignty. I should say that this is a description that the party, as far as I can tell, never used. Uh, it's, you know, sort of my retrospective uh, description. But it's, it's an approach that was articulated by the party many times and in many different conditions uh, over the decades. And I would say that in a particularly robust form, it came out in the economic platform that was adopted by uh, what was then called National Conventions in 1964. And that platform called for increased, uh, sorry, called for uh, repatriation of natural resources and their ownership by the people, public ownership and operation of industries, resource industries. And it also called for a national energy policy that would develop power resources and what's usually called an East-West All Canada Electric Power Grid. I think for the purposes though of this presentation, the main point is that from its earliest years, the Communist Party in Canada pressed for public ownership, sometimes called nationalization of natural resources as the necessary step to ensuring economic and social stewardship. And this insistence on the link between environmental, economic and social security remains one of the main pillars of the party's environmental policy. So the second uh, historical moment uh, is I, maybe pretentiously say, is recognizing the environment as an issue in its own right. And this came about, I think, in the 1960s and 70s, which also accompanied a, a shift in thinking around the environment more generally. So by this time, the effects of human activity on the natural world were becoming much more apparent. Air and water pollution, hazardous waste, pesticides, all of these things attracted scientific attention and they became the focus of social activism. And for the Communist Party in Canada, uh, these developments helped lead to a recognition of the environment, not just as an element of economic policy, but as an issue in its own. A little bit of a, a subtle but important difference, I think. And this began to be reflected in party documents in the early 1970s. So I referred to a, a paper by uh, one of the Alberta leaders of the party named uh, William Tomey. Uh, and he was at a night, uh, conference of the party's four Western provincial organizations in 1973. And he placed the demand for environmental protection among five, as, as among the five key elements of a countrywide policy on energy. So what he said was a national policy for the development and distribution of energy resources, particularly oil, needs to regulate production on the basis of preserving a depleting resource, develop alternate forms of energy, and provide for maximum ecological protection. This is, struck me as quite interesting, you know, in 1973, uh, and a party leader from a province which is enormously uh, dependent upon the oil industry, at a time when we aren't talking about things like peak oil, and, uh, you know, uh, the, the current understanding of the problems of fossil fossil fuels, um, but to call for specifically to recognize it's depleting, to call for uh, alternative forms, and to pin that together with maximum ecological protection, I thought was pretty uh, notable, and I was quite happy to read that. In uh, around the same time in 1970, uh, there were pollution control 
will bring thousands of Canadians into a clash with state monopoly capitalism and bring them sharply up against the harsh reality of the domination of our society by the big corporations. It is one more path that many will follow on the road to understanding the need for fundamental social change. Oh, he kind of, uh, I mean, it's a long article, but in that quote, he's sort of identifying this as a, a point of entry into the class struggle. And I think that's interesting. Despite the calls by people like Tommy and Swanky and others for stronger labor and socialist campaigning on the environment, the response was uneven. Uh, and just in terms of, it was uneven in terms of the labor movement generally, as well as in the Communist Party. And it took, the, from the party side, it took, I would say, about a decade or more for the issue to really become fully present in party activity. And as I say, I think this is, that's important too, that, you know, writing proceeds a little quicker, or in some cases a lot quicker than the actual response to it, the organizational response. And I think that that is not just a reflection on the Communist Party in Canada, but also a reflection on how the working class generally was responding to the, the, the environmental situation, what, what we now refer to usually as the environmental crisis. Um, I have uh, one example of this, and that was during the, uh, of this unevenness, and that was during the 1976 inquiry into the Mackenzie Valley pipeline. It's called the Berger Inquiry. Uh, and, and this project was essentially a proposal for a pipeline that would carry oil from Alaska down through Canada, south through Canada, into the U.S. And along the way, it would pick up oil from, from Canadian uh, sources. And the stakes were very high for capital, and the opposition to it was quite enormous. Um, one of the things that's notable, <laughs> unfortunately, it, I would say, is that in the Communist Party's submission to the inquiry, um, there were very slim references to the environment. Really, it only referenced the environment uh, in, when it reiterated the inquiry's own stated scope. And then there was a single sentence calling for protection of the environment and ecology of the North. Now, that's you know, not the best, I would say, um, that, that it didn't call for more action on the environment. But there were good things in that submission. It made very strong arguments about indigenous rights including the right to plan development, uh, the right of Indigenous people to plan development on or affecting their land. And this, you know, really notably foreshadowed current demands for uh, around UNDRIP, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People to have, uh, that have the right to, sorry, that Indigenous people have the right to consent to development on their land. It also talked, uh, the party submission in 76 also talked about the relationship between resource industry monopolies and uneven economic development. That's pretty important and, and uh, you know, continuing, not just uh, episodic uh, analysis. And it also referenced the long held policy of environmental sovereignty based on public ownership and control. So these are and these were and still are solid and progressive policies. There's no question in my mind. But the absence of, in the submission of analysis around the very real risks of mass pollution and environmental degradation is a noticeable gap. And I don't think it can be and should or should be dismissed as a single oversight. Uh, during five federal election campaigns between 1972 and 1984, there was not a lot of reference in Communist Party of Canada platforms to the environment. Um, and when there was reference, either in the context of the platforms or in interviews with party leaders, it tended to be couched in the context of policies that could facilitate industrial growth and economic development. So in this, con in this regard, after beginning to recognize the environment as an issue in and of itself, it, it does seem like the party slid back to the relative comfort of promoting long-held, almost exclusively promoting long-held policies like environmental sovereignty. And again, it's not that those policies that were being advanced were bad. Nationalization of, of natural resources and public ownership and control over resource industry are truly critical reforms. But the approach was truncated. It was like there was a retreat from uh, treating the environment as a standalone issue. That was kind of conspicuous at a time when public opinion, including among progressives, was increasingly aroused by issues of environmental degradation. So it is hard to look at this period and not 
conclude to some extent that there were some missed opportunities at developing uh, really strong working class environmental policies and using those to engage both the environmental movement uh, and, well, to, to engage the environmental movement to get it stronger and more radical shape, like anti-monopoly and anti-imperialist shape, um, and also as a way to engage other sections of the anti-monopoly and anti-imperialist movement to help give them an environmentalist shape. I think there was a bit of a missed opportunity there. And, and one of the contributing factors in that leg, I think, was probably related to the connection of the party to the environmental movement. And I think it's fair to describe that connection, uh, not just of the party, but of the labor movement generally, as weak, difficult, and uncomfortable. And just before we started this forum, um, I think Raj, I think you mentioned that, uh, you know, the two, the environmental movement and the, and the labor movement or the working class movement have often been kind of pitted against one another in some way. And, and this is just a reality that's been with us for many decades. Um, sorry. Uh, there are documents and articles and interviews through the 70s and into the 80s that, that do exhibit a bit of a preoccupation uh, and sometimes I would say even a suspicion about the nature and the role of the rapidly emerging environmentalist movement. So I mentioned earlier the article by Ben Swanky. Uh, you know, he, he paints a bit of a picture in that article of environmentalists as well-meaning liberals who cons whose concerns are urgent but overstated in their importance. And he, he counterposes the environmental movement to the peace movement, writing that uh, the environmental movement offers a safe and respectable cause uh, that doesn't attack the very foundations of imperialism. The anti-pollution movement, what he called it at the time, doesn't begin even to arouse the hostility and retaliatory action of the establishment as does the peace movement. There may be truth to that. I mean, I was only two years old when he wrote that, so it's not like I have personal experience of the movement at the time. Maybe that's true. Um, I tend to think that that's a bit of a, uh, a narrow approach to uh, the movement, but more importantly, I'm not, you know, I'm just not really sure that that, that leads to the right conclusion. Um, so there was this kind of tendency, I would say, to minimize the environmental movement and it got, it's been, ref, you know, it gets reflected elsewhere too. And so in the communist party, there was a, a 1984 article in communist viewpoint about anti-sealing protests. The author presents a strong analysis of the class relationships in the sealing industry in Newfoundland and Labrador. And the author highlights important realities uh, about sealing that were typically expunged from anti-sealing narratives. Um, but at the same time, the, the article contains a, a, what I think is a very sweeping dismissal of environmental organizations as being, quote, petty bourgeois and bourgeois. The author writes that its leaders, leaders of the environmental movement, uh, vociferous leaders mainly of the middle and upper classes whose campaigns were essentially religious experience for the participants. This, this kind of you know, sweeping dismissal, I don't think is, well, looking back, it's, it's not useful. But again, it, it's just, it's so sweeping, it's so suspicious, it's so dismissive. And I, I, you know, I think that that is, um, that was, again, a missed opportunity. The author of that article does argue later that cross-class alliances like the environmental movement are important areas for the political left to work. Um, and, he, uh, and I think that's a good point. And he also says that there is a heightened tension around how to pursue that class, uh, sorry, that task. And that's an important observation, such a tension is not to be unexpected. It's something that the labor movement has grappled with for many years. Uh, the role of broad social movements in the class struggle and the question of how the labor movement, and for me, how the Communist Party in particular, should relate to those movements is an important and constant question and always has to be approached dialectically. You know, so by the mid-1980s, Communist Party here had begun to recognize the tremendous growth well, had recognized the tremendous growth in mass democratic movements, um, both growth in terms of their size, but also in terms of increasing radicalism and militancy, and also began to recognize their importance to the class struggle. And some of the documents from the later 1980s describe 
surging democratic movements, including the environmental movement, as being a political force alongside the workers' struggle. So there was this emerging awareness uh, and appreciation of, move, of social movements and of the environmental movement uh, as something in its own that, that needed to be uh, taken seriously and, and was a component or could be a component of class struggle. And reflecting this deeper understanding of the environment and the environmental movement, the Communist Party began to project a more clear set of policies for the defense of the environment. So during the 1988 federal election in Canada, the platform called for a comprehensive environmental cleanup, for action against acid rain, for stiff penalties for polluters, for expanding, expanded funding for conservation, for bans on toxic chemicals and clear cutting, and for a moratorium on nuclear power development. Um, so that was good, that was very welcome. But it was also notable that in that same federal election platform, even though there was this expanded environmental section, it didn't include any reference to jobs or to work. And so there was this long-standing demand for public ownership and direction of resource industries as a means for guiding, de uh, for guiding development. Um, and that at least appeared for the 88 election appeared to be a bit detached from environmental policy. And it gives the feeling that the party's environmental platform at that point was more a reiteration of social movement demands than a set of policies reflecting a strong Marxist analysis of the environmental crisis. And so this kind of brings us to the current, what I argue is the current sort of context, which is the work towards developing a concentrated working class environmentalism. So this began I would argue in the 1990s. Now that was a very difficult period for the Communist Party in Canada. It had emerged from an internal struggle against liquidation. Uh, it had a much smaller membership than before that struggle, reduced uh, leadership cater and seriously diminished resources. Uh, and then almost immediately after that, there was another attack on the Communist Party in the form of very undemocratic changes to electoral legislation. So I won't get into, but all of which is to say that the priorities for the new leadership at that time were consolidation, stabilization, and rebuilding. Um, and so policy development definitely took something of a backseat to those more immediate organizational concerns. But even then, uh, there were efforts being made to engage uh, this question of concentrated working class environmentalism. Um, and one of those uh, early signals, I would say, was in an article in 1994 in uh, the Communist Party's new, at that time, uh, political discussion bulletin, which is called The Spark. Uh, it was written by Kimball Carriou, who was the editor of People's Voice for 26 years. He's my predecessor of People's Voice, and he's still a member of the party's central executive. Uh, and he wrote, uh, he wrote about the, the party's, uh, well, he says, failure to make a systematic study of the growing global crisis of the environment or to develop a serious policy to resolve the crisis. He's quite critical in that article. In that same article, he, he makes some very, uh, very important, I think, uh, observations and draws some important conclusions. He notes the tremendous responsibility borne by capitalism, obviously, but he also raised important critical questions about environmental degradation in the Soviet Union and other socialist states. And he concludes in the article that a working class or Marxist environmentalism needs to go further than simply critiquing capitalism. He writes, industrial and other forms of economic activity cannot expand indefinitely without endangering the biosphere in which we live and exhausting our finite supply of resources we need to develop a concept of socialism, which is not based on an ever increasing accumulation of material goods. This pretty notable conclusion, and I don't think it was unique to, to that writer or to our party, but that's a pretty important uh, step. And this similar position, or this position was reinforced in a, a position paper, which was written, um, I think in 1995 or 1996, uh, as part of efforts to update the Communist Party's program. And that essay 
provided a detailed analysis of the impact of economic development on the environment. And it concludes that the scale of capitalist accumulation has raised the exploitation of nature to unparalleled levels and altered fundamentally labor's relationship with labor. The author of that article notes it or argues that there are limits to the material consumption of humanity to the what he calls the carrying capacity of the environment. And he argues that this necessitates limits on human activity and further argues that those limits must be accomplished through class struggle. Really important observation, I think. And based on that, in part on that, the party, our party in Canada, took a significant step forward when it updated its program in 2001, uh, because that, that included a number of changes, including a robust section on the environmental crisis. And the little quote that I read to you earlier was, was part of that. It critiqued capitalism for causing massive destruction and extinction, and specifically identified imperialism as the fundamental cause of environmental degradation and resource use inequality. And while it critiqued the experience of previous socialist societies, the program asserted the necessity of socialism for environmental security. Um, the update, the program update, identified that resolving the tension between workers' economic demands and the need to protect the environment was a key area of work to advance the revolutionary struggle. And here's how the program put it. It said, labor's struggle for safety, health, and job security in the work environment is indivisible with the struggle to protect and restore the whole environment and for a fundamental shift in thinking and economic relations with the environment. The greater scale of capitalist exploitation and crises means that environmental concerns are now inescapably linked to working class living conditions, including in Canada. Parts of organized labor, particularly some resource-based unions, have bought into the corporate agenda that pits environmental protection against employment. It is of vital importance for labor and environmental organizations to recognize that the protection of the environment is in the long-term interest of sustainable employment and for communities to unite against their common enemy monopoly capitalism. So this, this uh, what I describe as a new programmatic direction, it's probably not quite new, but I mean, it's certainly a, a step forward. This was further refined in, in uh, sorry, in 2009, when the Central Committee of our party released what it called the People's Energy Plan. So this was an effort to update our longstanding energy policies and uh, reflected an integrated analysis of current economic and environmental conditions at the time in 2009. And so it maintained the call for an east-west power grid as the desired vehicle for energy sovereignty, but it placed a much met a greater weight on public ownership and democratic control in all aspects of production, extraction, refinement, distribution, and sale. And that this emphasis was a step beyond some of the earlier articulations of energy policy, which had, um, well, for example, in 1963, the party's energy policy at the time said, we do not, we on our part do not suggest that private capital should be obstructed from developing great hydroelectric power sites. We argue only that their construction and the sale of their current should be regulated. It goes on. So, you know, that's important, but it's a, a step forward to call for their, um, uh, public ownership and democratic control of, of all aspects of that industry uh, in 2009. The document, A People's Energy Plan, includes an anal analysis of the relationship between resource extraction and uh, both colonialism and Canada's imperialist foreign policy. So uh, the imperialist foreign policy rooted in uh, militarism and war and colonialism, where we argued that development on Indigenous land can only proceed with Indigenous people's full knowledge and consent. Uh, the document also took aim at uh, capitalist solutions to uh, the, well, what we've now called the climate crisis, solutions like carbon taxes and cap and trade schemes, which simply represent the efforts to commodify or at least marketize the right to pollute. Uh, and against these, uh, counterposed to those communist party calls for strict legal limits and stiff penalty, strict legal limits on pollution and stiff penalties for corporate offenders. 
Probably the biggest element and the most notable element of the 2009 People's Energy Plan was the call for a deliberate economic transition away from fossil fuel use. And that includes a moratorium on the development of tar sands, sometimes called oil sands, uh, uh, and shale gas operations, and the progressive closure of existing operations. Uh, includes opposition to oil and pipelines, an end to coal-fired and nuclear power generation, and a massive program to ensure a just economic and social transition for affected workers and communities. The deteriorating environmental and climate crises, as well as ongoing economic developments, mean that there are, of course, constant discussions about party policies uh, in these areas. And some of the current questions include uh, how to treat new technologies like carbon capture and storage, What's the role of localized small scale power generation uh, developments in incineration and cogeneration operations? Uh, what is the continued applicability of an east west power grid, which is heavily reliant on mega projects? Uh, and what's the nature and what are the limits of cross class alliances and the possible role of an expressly anti imperialist current within the environmental movement? So these and other issues uh, need to be confronted but they need to be confronted in the overall context of an approaching existential crisis, an environmental crisis, whose rate of acceleration means that the timeline for change is shortening. Uh, and so this critical work of developing a concentrated working class environmental, environmentalism presents um, the party and other working class organizations with a sizable dilemma. And that is, how do you give priority to the struggle for workers' jobs, wages, and benefits, while at the same time promoting limits on economic activities that often provide those same necessities. But engaging such a contradictory circumstance is precisely the task of the Communist Party, which seeks through concrete analysis of concrete conditions and the creative application of Marxism to bring revolutionary consciousness to the masses. To avoid this task, either by simply repeating the spontaneous demands of the environmental movement, or by simply repeating the immediate economic demands of workers, is to facilitate the stagnation of socialist thought. And doing so would abandon huge sections of the working class to the domination of bourgeois ideology, and it would abandon, abandon the entire human species to the destructive conclusion of unended capitalism. And this, of course, is a paraphrasing of Lenin's uh, words in What is to be Done. Uh, he's not talking about the environment at, at that point. He's talking about economism and political consciousness. I think it's important to note that at the end of the day, a livable environment requires socialism, and socialism requires a livable environment. And so this is one reason why we say the working class has a world to win and a planet to save. So I'll stop there. Thank you for listening. And uh, I do look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Dave. Uh, very informative presentation. So uh, while people think about their questions and comments, we will have some announcements. Uh, so Jean, please go ahead. And then Jean will be followed, I hope, by Richard Fallenbaum to, for Fund Appeal. And so please, Jean, go ahead. Well, well th <clears throat> thanks so much, Dave, for such a um, comprehensive and uh, thoughtful presentation. And I'm certain we have a lot to discuss. But let me just mention what we have on the books. Uh, next week, uh, we have Talking Socialism. Um, as you know, socialism is very much talked about these days. And there's the question what the left should be clear about exactly what we say when we talk the talk. And uh, are we prepared to move our ideas from the lecture halls to the halls of power? And our speaker will be longtime democratic socialist, Tom Gallagher. Uh, he was elected to the Massachusetts State Legislature in 1982, running as an open socialist, but he quickly earned the nickname, Tommy the Commie. Um, so he will be speaking um, uh, on uh, next week on Sunday, and he's spoken to us before and he's a familiar figure, so uh, he'll be welcome here, I'm sure, uh, as well as being provocative. Um, 
Sunday, October 17th, uh, we got nothing, but hopefully something will come up. Sunday, October 24th, uh, Quo Vadis Turkey, a crumbling fascism in the Middle East under imperialism. And ICSS member, uh, Mehmet Bayam, um, who spent the last few months in his native Turkey, will report on goings on there. October 31st, cooperative economics with our speaker, Surat Lin, uh, who will talk on that issue. And on November 7th, we will celebrate uh, the uh, anniversary of the great Soviet revolution, October revolution. The title will be October after October, a century of socialist revolution. And Raj and I will team up on that one. Um, and so uh, we have some good things coming up um, and um, please uh, put these on your calendar and come back. They'll all be on the website very soon. They're not quite there yet, but will be soon. So, um, and over to Richard, I guess. Yeah, Richard, yes, please. Thank you. Um, well, for those of you who would like to contribute to the work of ICSS, um, one way you can do it is through a financial contribution. And I put on the chat some information uh, um, on the channels in which you can contribute. The same information is on our uh, a weekly email announcement. It's also on our website. So I, it currently is a very small minority of, of uh, stalwart supporters who are contributing, but it would be helpful if more contributed. So I strongly urge you. Thank you. And uh, Richard, I want to say that uh, uh, many of our members are retired and they don't have a high income. So if they want to contribute very small amount, but uh, on a monthly basis, like $5, would that be acceptable? Of course, of course. All right. Uh, so with that, thank you, Richard. And so we now move in to uh, questions and comment period. And the way you can, uh, you raise your hand uh, uh, by going to reactions, if you have the current version of Zoom on your computer or whatever you're using, tablet or phone. And then through that, you can raise your hands and I already see three hands raised here, four hands, sorry. So I do not know the sequence, but uh, let's start out with Norma. Let's start out with uh, Norma as the first one followed by Yusuf, then Richard and then Jean, if that's okay with uh, folks here. Sounding so good. Norma please. Norma, please go ahead. So my favorite theme the idea of how we can enable people to envision what they think way in the back of their minds, which of course is a decent life, a pleasant life. And it's really hard for people to do without relying on calling for jobs, for decent pay, wages, the idea we have is ourselves to think of the whole scene that we're trying to work about. That is the eradication of wages and jobs and the uh, promotion of people to be able to think of living in a world where we do what needs to be done, that our community sees the need and supports it and is pleased with the work, whatever anybody signs on to. It's a whole comprehensive picture because mine includes that three-year-olds and 99-year-olds are able to participate in what's called work because everybody has something to contribute to production regardless of limitations. And that means there is no eight hour day. <laughs> for three-year-olds and everybody. There, is thing, there are things that need to be done that people want to do that gives satisfaction for the doing. 
And you know that because you do that on Saturday and Sunday. <laughs> and I don't mean Dave, I mean everybody. Um, and that while we're talking about short range objectives and maintenance of our being able to get dinner where we are lucky enough to provide for ourselves, that we, we have to encourage people to reflect back on what they want in this world because that's the, without arousing the huge sentiment of a pleasant life by and for all of us, we're not going to gain much, let's say. I say we're not going to gain anything because we'll just, anytime we win any of those advances, anytime we win, for example, a pay raise, it's taken from us in one form or another, as we see now. Uh, with the, the prices of goods being almost unattainable. Uh, my, my memory always is being in the checkout line in a grocery store and watching an elderly person begin to cry at the cost of the eggs. He says, I can't afford this and was virtually either on the edge of tears or actually crying. This is a long time ago. It's about 20 or 30 years ago. So his suffering is with me today. Thank you. Uh, you have any uh, questions for uh, Dave uh, to ask or shall I? You know, I don't have any questions. I have all the answers. Okay, thank you, Norma. Okay, so uh, I think the next one is Yusuf. Uh, Yusuf, please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, for your talk, it's nice to hear what our comrades just uh, uh, up north are uh, doing. Uh, here on this side of the border, um, CPUSA uh, a few years ago expanded its slogan, um, uh, people uh, before profits to people and nature before profit. Uh, I would like to add that I think it is important um, to draw to hear uh, uh, and U.S. Peace Council is doing work uh, along these lines um, uh, to draw the environmental I think it's a movement into the peace movement uh, that a, a war is is bad for the environment. <laughs> It's obvious, but also uh, uh, during uh, peacetime, so-called peacetime, I mean, uh, all this military machinery, um, the uh, Pentagon has uh, one of the largest uh, carbon footprints. Uh, now, the uh, Pentagon is a climate change denier. Uh, it's uh, very much supports it, but the answers are all wrong. Uh, um, uh, so uh, I, I think uh, it is important to bring uh, the BBA. Uh, I think the environmental movement and the peace movement are allies. Uh, and I would uh, like you to um, elaborate uh, on this. Dave, you want to respond to it? And if you do, you have to unmute yourself. Okay, sure. Yeah, I can just comment on that uh, really quickly. Um, that's an excellent point. Um, and I used to, I, I'm kind of nice that you mentioned the US Peace Council. I used to be president of the Canadian Peace Congress, which is uh, the affiliate organization here. And so I knew, I got to know people like Henry Lowendorf and Al Martyr through the World Peace Council. So it was really nice. Um, yes, the, uh, the biggest single uh, consumer of oil in the world is the US military. And it consumes roughly the same amount of oil as um, Ireland. And, you know, that's really a, quite, a, a, people really think about that when they, and I, I came across that statistic when I was writing some uh, articles on uh, NATO, and what NATO membership meant to, to not to foreign policy in Canada, but to domestic policy in Canada. And I was looking at how having oil uh, specific energy generally and oil specifically identified by the military and by NATO as a um, 
as a security issue. So the United States uh, drove a lot of Canadian uh, domestic policies in a particular direction. But even in Canada, I mean, the, you know, it's easy for us to talk about the U.S. Uh, military because it is comparatively so much bigger. But at the same time, the Canadian military um, in the in the government in, in the Canadian government's uh, what do they call it uh, carbon budget uh, I guess which is a breakdown of, of you know different departments and the, the footprint that they have the the Department of National Defense uh, occupies far and away the biggest single chunk of that which is 49 percent and that's just the Department of Defense that doesn't include other elements and within things like uh, our uh, legislation here about the um, environmental protection um Act. Uh, I'm not sure if that's quite the, I can't remember if that's the exact name for it. I'm sorry. But all kinds of military activities are excluded from any scrutiny of carbon footprints and things like this. So you've got, it's just so, I mean, it's laughable, except that it's not funny at all, that the biggest offender is actually not measured or monitored in many cases. And so uh, I, I think that's an excellent point. And I, I, I'm going to make sure that I add that to any future presentations that, you know, Really having a having a, a much stronger focus on um, on the uh, on the military. It's something we campaigned on actually. In the, we just came out of a federal election here in Canada, and we um, uh, we did uh, the Communist Party ran some candidates, and we did campaign on that exact point, saying you know um, military spending, but also the military impact on on uh, carbon emissions and stuff. So, yeah, I really appreciate that comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Richard. Uh... Uh, right, you are next, uh, and followed by uh, Jean after you. So go ahead, Richard, please. Yeah, th thank you for the presentation, David. It was very good. Um, I think I might have mentioned uh, before everything started that I just got back from uh, uh, from a, almost uh, two months up in Maine, and uh, while I was up there, I one of the one of the um, one of the things that kept coming across the TV is, is a proposition to roll back uh, some LePage uh, uh, era enacted um, uh, uh, basically clear cutting uh, for the central main power. And I don't know if you're aware of this or not. Um, anyways, basically it's, a, it's an attempt to bring um, electrical distribution down into New England, down into Boston and then and there and then uh, uh, distributed from there um, uh, to to where it's needed uh, in New England. Um, to me, that highlights a point that you sort of alluded to, but never really addressed, and that is uh, that the environment really is a cross-border uh, uh, phenomenon, and uh, and nowhere. Did, uh, and I'm kind of wondering about this. Uh, in, in your presentation, did you mention anything about um, uh, working um, uh, working across the borders or internationally uh, with, for example, the people in Maine, uh, amongst others, of course. I mean, the, 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 there's the oil pipelines, the, the oil sands and, and that. But I'm wondering what, what your position is uh, on the, uh, or what the, uh, C, the Canadian CP's position is uh, uh, to work in cross 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 borders because it's, it's becoming increasingly uh, more of an international working class phenomenon. Thank you, Raj. Would you like me to comment on that now, or should I wait? Yes, yes go ahead. Okay, okay. Let's um, again, that's a that's a excellent comment, <laughs> a really good one. Um, and uh, yeah, there are, are. I agree that there are all kinds of. Um, key struggles happening right now that do involve uh, cross-border uh, coalitions or cross-border cooperation. The one that's happening here in my province or related to my province would be Line 5, which is a pipeline going from Michigan uh, across Lake Michigan. And uh, so there's a, uh, we, uh, you asked about the party's policy. We, we, um, we don't really have a, a policy on that. We certainly are not opposed to uh, working cross borders. And I, I guess probably the most recent example of us doing that actually involves the, the peace movement that uh, Yusuf was talking about earlier. Um, things like uh, um, campaigning against NATO membership, for example, which admittedly is quite different in the United States than in Canada in some ways. But, you know, those kind of campaigns drawing attention to NATO um, 
general general peace and disarmament work. I think there's been a lot of cooperation uh, that we've been a part of. We haven't necessarily led it in some in, in all cases, but we've been a part of that kind of uh, push. I think that though, the, I'll just finish by saying, I think that that is a really, um, I guess I hadn't really thought of uh, explicitly of environmental work as being a key area where we need to push that forward. So I, I just made a big note of that, that we, we need to think about how we're going to, um, uh, you know, organize on a cross-border, I think there's a term used on a cross-border capacity, because I think that that is quite important. Uh, and there are organizations and, and movements that, you know, I think would be very easy to plug together and and make more powerful thank you uh okay next is jean Ru. jean please go ahead yeah well again thank you so much for the putting this program together um whenever the topic of environmentalism comes up i always kind of my statement is don't blame me i voted for barry commoner and for those of you who don't remember Barry, he was the presidential candidate in 1980. He was one of the first environmentalists. He wrote uh, The Closing Circle and um, uh, Peace with the Planet and other things. And so, you know, if we elected, had elected um, uh, commoner uh, instead of who we did in, in elect, uh, we wouldn't be in this mess right now. So I just wanted to make that observation, but I have another comment because for me, uh, the cutting edge of environmentalism on the one hand is with the First Nations uh, in Canada and here in the United States. They're the ones that are getting beaten up, bitten by dogs, thrown in jail and all of this. And they're really a crucial part uh, of the uh, environmental movement and not only in their activism, but also their ideology of, of uh, their relationship with uh, the, the world and so on. So I think that's something that I wish you'd covered a little more. And the other thing side of that is uh, young people. Um, I remember there's, uh, you know, they're in the cutting edge also uh, because they have so much to lose. I remember AOC in a recent talk uh, at a demonstration said, well, most of my colleagues in Congress, this is the hottest year of their lives. For me and us, other people, it's gonna be the coolest year of our lives. And that, that uh, kind of says a lot to me. And I, I just like uh, to hear your comments on those two questions. Thank you. Yep, both uh, very, very uh, good points, I think, thanks. Um, so just in terms of young people, it, it's interesting. We just uh, just came out of a meeting uh, I don't know, two days ago or something. We were talking, some of us, about this, how there's really been a, well, the comment that the, one of the people made was, you know, for young younger people, um, they just, this is the issue for them. This is what, what kind of has defined their approach to political uh, and, and, and social work. And... Um, it is climate change in the environment. And for me, I, I related that to the question of um, uh, of the arms race. So I'm, I'm 53 years old. I, you know, uh, sort of, I grew up during the, the later elements of the Cold War and I sort of became more politically aware during Reagan and Thatcher. And, uh, you know, so we watched all those movies like the day after the morning, whatever it's called. And, you know, we were just kind of grew up with this this reality that we all kind of wondered are is this going to be the day where we get obliterated it's a horrible thing um and uh so for my generation or part of my generation that was sort of a defining political feature you know it was a conduit for us to get involved with so many other things uh you go from the peace the anti anti-nuclear arms and you move into international solidarity for example and then you go other directions. And I think that that's exactly what we're seeing happen with uh, younger people right now and environment and climate justice movements. Um, it's it's an immediate concern and, and it's amazing how many have picked it up. I mean, climate strikes in high schools and all these things, just an incredible surge of activism and organizing. And it's wonderful to see, but it's also, as you suggest, it's wonderful to see um, that be, be also a conduit for 
for people to to get involved in, in many other areas. And it, it's not like they wouldn't have got involved in those other areas anyway, because they also impact their lives. But it's really important to see. Uh, just in terms of Indigenous people, yes, it's uh, in First Nations. Um, absolutely. And there's been a, perhaps you're aware of it, there's, there's been a, a, I guess, again, a surge, I would say, in, in uh, across Canada, and not just, uh, about uh, land defense, uh, indigenous, indigenous resistance, and solidarity with um, those land defense actions and that and that resistance. And for me, one of the interesting, uh, uh, interesting is such a sterile way to put it, but I mean, important uh, episodes was when the Canadian government under Justin Trudeau decided to buy a pipeline. Right, they bought the the uh, the Trans Mountain Extension, and they did so precisely because uh, there was opposition from <clears throat> the First Nation community that that pipeline <clears throat> was going through, Go. and the only entity, the only entity in this country, I think, that is capable, that has the, the ability to um, to intervene and override those land rights of indigenous people is the Canadian government. They shouldn't have that right, by the way, but they, they, they hold that right. And they did so by buying that pipeline and then enforcing that pipeline by sending the RCMP, which is Canada's national police force, into uh, to indigenous land to break up uh, indigenous uh, resistance. And I think, you know, that really just s crystallized the connection between the environment oil industry, capitalism, the state, and colonialism towards Indigenous people. And I, it didn't just crystallize it for me. I mean, it, that was clear to so many. It just a horrible incident that provoked uh, so much solidarity and so much resistance activity. And I, um, so there is, you're right, I didn't speak to that. And, and I should have, uh, I didn't speak to either of those questions you raised, and I should have. But yes, absolutely. That's a, a very important element of um of politics of the environment and and uh you know it, it bleeds into other very you know other serious questions that we have to grapple with on the political left in canada but yeah for the purpose of this it's a it's it's just again it's been such a conduit for increasing uh activism and and uh, and i think in deepening deepening analysis as well okay uh thank you and we have another hand raised, Michael, K, or, or Susan. They they are together usually. I don't know who is raising that hand today, but please go ahead. It's Susan's hand. Yeah, hi, Susan. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Welcome. Dave. Yeah. Could you talk more about the situation with <clears throat> um, labor and the climate, particularly? fossil fuel workers, particularly the building trades. We're contending with that here. If you can compare with the US, that would be helpful. Because I, I know that there are various things happening in Canada I would like to hear about. Thank you. That's, that's a, a very interesting question. When uh, I don't know if, if you folks know this, but uh, in Canada, there's I think roughly a quarter of the labor movement is actually made up of unions that are headquartered in the United States. Uh, they call themselves international unions. People like me call them U.S. based unions. But I mean, it's sort of a funny, peculiar reality of Canadian labor history that there was a period of time uh, when there was a, an awful lot of labor organizing that happened was was done through uh, via unions that were based in the U.S. Uh, and, it, you know, it wasn't always I mean, it wasn't always a problem either. I mean, the, the CIO unions came in and, and did a, a lot of great work. So, but it is sort of a funny situation. I think it's roughly a quarter. And where that's particularly um, uh, concentrated, I would say, is, it, is actually in the building trades unions. Uh, so we do have some industrial unions that come from the US. So uh, steel workers, uh, Teamsters, I used to be in the Teamsters years ago. Um, when I worked in printing, um, but also the uh, you know a lot of the building 
and construction trades uh, unions are, are based out of the United States. So they do have, you know, their own set of policies for Canada because, you know, there's a, a different state to deal with. Uh, but they also have, you know, some consistent policies across their whole union. And so there is a, I think it's fair to say there's a real merging of, of uh, those approaches. Sometimes they can be strong and sometimes they can be weak, but, you know, there is that kind of merger. I think, um, I do think that this is something that, uh, well, I was just talking to my partner uh, about this earlier today. Um, I said, you know, I think for a lot of unions, and maybe I'm on a limb by saying this, but this is kind of what I think is that for a lot of, of unions and trade union members, um, I think there is a recognition of say the environment and climate change, climate justice as very real, very immediate issues. But I think it's often understood to be not part of their experience as working class people, if you know what I mean. And so they, you know, people might say, I do all this work in my union and then I do all this work to support climate justice, which is another progressive issue. But they don't necessarily see it as a progressive issue that actually it is deeply connected to, they don't see it as a class issue necessarily, they don't see it as something that's deeply connected to their work and the community. And that's a, a, a tricky thing to, to, try and, to try and work on. And you know, some of the comments that Nora made earlier uh, relate to that, you know, how, do you, how do you get people to think beyond the, you don't wanna diminish the bread and butter issues, but I mean, they do have to think beyond that. Um, I suspect that, uh, and I haven't looked into this really in detail, but I, I suspect that the same, the unevenness in terms of the labor movement on this issue that you're going to see in the United States is probably, you know, almost identical uh, in Canada. I, I, I may be wrong with that, but, you know, unions that are involved in resource extraction, um, for example, are going to obviously find it difficult to, <laughs> to support a policy which limits resource extraction. Um, my, uh, the, I grew up in a little town in Ontario and the, the main industry there was nuclear energy. So, you know, it's, and it's a, it's a tough, it's a tough sell to go to people and say, okay, here's all the problems of nuclear energy. Here's why we should stop building it and roll out of it and do something else. And they're like, yo, <laughs> like, this is my livelihood. This is my job. This pays for my house. This pays for my, you know, education for my kids, what have you. And so I think that, and this is, this is kind of where this is sort of the, the, the fulcrum that I was, that for me, this question of working class environmentalism really rests on that somehow we have to articulate, um, we have to articulate the environmental crisis in a way that working people can grab it as a class issue and, and incorporate environment, environmental tactics, I guess, into their, their approach you know, on the job. And I realize that is a tall, tall order. I mean, that is not easy at all. But I do think that the stakes are so high that this is precisely what we have to do. Um, you know, I, I think if we don't do that, and I, I kind of finished my presentation with this line, this paraphrased line from, from Lenin, that if we, if we don't do that, if the political left and the, and the, you know, the socialist left doesn't do that, we're basically abandoning the field to capitalist ideologies and capitalist solutions. And there's a range of those, right? I mean, like, you know, just like in your country, there's politicians in my country who say, no, no such thing as a climate problem. It's just things getting warmer and they've always done that and big deal, you know. And then, you know, and then you get to people on, you know, the Green Party and the Social Democratic left, which in our country is generally called the NDP, who have their solutions as well, their proposed, but they tend to be capitalist, market-friendly, capitalist-oriented solutions, which are not, in my argument, not fundamentally going to solve the problem or be able to maintain a solution for any length of time. So 
this this is just the most fascinating question from you because to me this is the this is the biggest single challenge and you know i've had people uh say to me you're wrong you're you're absolutely wrong to uh to promote working class environmentalism because you're talking about i don't you know two things that cannot be reconciled and and to me that's i don't i don't support that uh, obviously i mean i i think they do have to be reconciled um, not dissimilar from fighting for gender equality, uh, for example, is something that, you know, we need to, I, and, and so many Marxist feminist writers have done this or tried to do this, write about gender equality in a way that helps us to understand why gender inequality is a key feature of reproducing capitalism. And therefore, overcoming that involves being the, not just that reason, of course, but just because it's the right thing to do too. But, you know, so I think it's about sort of bringing the issue of the environment and, and climate justice really deeply into the working class movement and um, to the point that, uh, you know, people have a, a much more uh, powerful understanding of how it impacts and how it relates to their work, their community, their livelihood. And, and there is an awful lot of work to be done there. So that's that's not really an answer to your question. It's more comments coming off of your question. And I'm sorry for that. Let me just ask a follow up. Is there a discussion and work on just transition? Yes, absolutely. And um, some of that. So there's a there's a, a magazine, for example, here. Well, there's a number of labor oriented magazines here, and a lot of them have um, begun to dig into that question uh, of just transition, what would it look like? And they've been working to engage unions in that process. And there are unions themselves who have certainly um, pushed forward with that. You know, in the Canadian Labour Congress, which is basically the equivalent of the AFL-CIO, um, you know, they, they've, they haven't shied away from this question of, of just transition. Uh, I, I, think, I think there's I can't imagine how they wouldn't be struggling with how to deal with it because they've got to, you know, represent all those different unions and all that range of workers. But there is discussion going on about just transition, and in the the, the publication that I uh, edit, People's Voice, we're beginning to sort of drill down and and try and try and talk more uh, in more detail about what a just transition would look like to you know educational and, and agitational work that relates to just transition. Um, and, and of course, within the Communist Party as well, we're we're talking all the time about that. But it is a it's a so it is it is proceeding for sure, and it's proceeding on a number of labor fronts. But it is an enormously difficult uh, uh, task to navigate. I think it, it's fair to say, and I, and I think that is because um, there has been this historical <coughs> excuse me this historical counterpositioning of labor and workers to the environment. Um, and, uh, you know, and I've worked in industries where that's been a factor. Uh, I, I, for many years, I worked as a printer uh, and, you know, huge amounts of waste paper, huge amounts of ener energy being used uh, printing newspapers. And, you know, uh, nobody wants to sort of not have a news, have that job, well-paid jobs. But at the same time, we need to somehow deepen the approach so that, you know, I'm, I'm not being very coherent and I, I apologize for that, but Yes, just transition is is essential, that we, and it really is a, a, a I think a, an issue that we can use very effectively to try and flesh up this working class grab on on environmentalism. Uh, Yusuf wants to come back again, but let me ask a question. If you, is that okay, Yusuf? If I ask the question, then you follow me. Uh, sure. Okay. So um, I think that's. Uh, a very difficult thing for uh, uh, for you, you or any of us, to argue against people's uh, job security. Okay, and if you're associated with an industry that's highly polluting, uh, and you say this industry has to end, that is a very difficult argument because then what do they do? I mean, actually, Democratic Party lost to Trump because uh, the Democratic Party candidate, not that she was that great a candidate, 
she also uh, said, you know, the coal industry will be replaced. So uh, it lost a lot of support. Now, I think a couple of things here, and then I want you to comment. The thing is that individual unions are, are going, their primary job is to protect their workers' living condition and get them fair wages, okay? That's their primary thing. Lenin says that, okay? In fact, that was his argument against uh, uh, the other side, which ended up being Menshevik, but they were not Menshevik at that point. The argument arose in 1903 when he wrote what is to be done. And I think that's the question you are confronting and we're all confronting what is to be done because you have to integrate these two things. And that's the job of the Communist Party, not of individual unions. And how articulate, for example, if the climate changes, destroys a lot of forest, burns a lot of forest, we lose jobs for people who work in the forest industry. Okay, and so if oil industry workers keep their job and foreign industry workers lose their jobs and their houses and all that, uh, for the working class as a whole, that's a loss. But then there is the further job of how to undermine both capitalism and imperialism because as you've recognized, the problem will not be solved until uh, you know we overthrow it and that the crisis is upon us. So it's not as if we have 30, 40, 50 years from now to worry about it. It is right upon us. So it urgency uh, of the thing. So evolving a, a communist alternative to this question, because as soon as I talk about uh, environment as an important issue, people say, well, but the workers need to live better. So uh, if, you, if you curtail production that supports workers' life, that would not be good. Uh, but there are, capitalism is a wasteful and violent uh, arrangement by its very nature. So uh, in the meantime, we don't have power. The people who want socialism don't have power, much of the world. So, and the other part who do have power have yielded, in my opinion, to capitalism as a, as a means to uh, develop. So there is also that theoretical level problem that remains, which is what is the alternate vision that we have of a society, communist society that you actually very, uh, I'm very glad to hear that you addressed it right early on saying, look, you can't be just going on uh, with the high level of consumption. When we talk about high level of consumption, it is not of the working class. It's uh, it's for the classes above the working class, but also among the working class that is being promoted. So the vision has to change. And I would like you to address a little, little bit more if you could. And then we'll go to Yusuf and then Jean. I think you're right, Raj. This is precisely the, the, you know, the, the difficult question that's before us is, is, is that. Um, I think, I think part of the, the approach is to, to be able to describe some, you know, you, you don't want to get into, well, uh, you know, really, really sort of teleological approaches or something, you know, here, here's what socialism will look like and, and this is it, you know, you, but you do have to be able to describe some, put some content to that vision, you know, I mean, you can't just say, oh, it's going to be all tickety-boo and, and, and there won't be any problems. You, you know, there does have to be an intentional approach and that involves, uh, that involves speaking to things like, very concretely to things like equality, to things like climate justice, to, you know. And so I think that's part of it is, is to put more environmental content or climate justice content into what we talk about or what we what we look towards when we talk about socialism and you know and, and putting content into our vision of socialism is not completely beyond the pale of course i mean <laughs> pretty much any party program has some description of what they want to see um so i think i think being more intentional and deliberate about adding uh, environmental justice to that picture would really help and and 
we have it's not just about environmental justice about how environmental justice relates to jobs and wages and pensions and, and production you know and standards of living uh, so that's part of it I, I think another part of it is and uh somebody and i can't remember who it was i'm sorry somebody mentioned this you know putting putting things together um you know environment and peace and and, and environment and jobs and and i think sort of presenting more of a before we even get to the vision of socialism just presenting a, a really a much more comprehensive and, and and understandable picture of how the economy and production works i think would be helpful too so and let me explain a little bit more of what i mean so um looking at uh you know, jobs. So let's say I work in a, in a carbon intensive or a fossil fuel intensive industry, and I'm worried when somebody from the Communist Party or somebody wherever comes along and says, well, we want to close down this industry and has, have a just transition. And of course, I'm going to be on my back foot. And of course, I'm going to be wondering, okay, where, where does this take me? Where does this take my family? Where does this take my community? And those are all important questions. Um, but I think being able to well, I guess answering those questions really in the bluntest uh, way is, is really important. That we can't just say to people, oh. uh, "Don't worry, we'll, we'll find something," and and you know it'll be at the same wages and you'll get the same benefits and and all this kind of stuff. I mean, that's that's pretty that's a pretty thin assurance, you know. You like if I were at the bargaining table and the boss ponied up something like that, I wouldn't believe it, you know, and I don't think any union rep would. So. You know, we do have to. We do have a responsibility to be, I think, more not prescriptive, but more descriptive about what we mean by just transition. And some of that means looking at at types of production that need to go on. So when we talk in the a good example, I think, or a good jumping off point is when we talked about the, you know, it's called different things, but here in Canada, we often called it uh, the peace dividend. You know, after the Cold War and all this money that was spent on on the military budget would come back in the form of increased uh, social program spending or, or you know or when we talk about military conversion you know that used to be a, a big campaign back in the 1980s military conversion and people actually the peace movement actually came up with in many cases very robust uh visions of what what it would mean you know when you uh, I remember here, here in Toronto, for example, there was a huge military base in the north part of the city. It's closed now, but uh, there was a whole uh, campaign uh, about converting that. It was a conversion project for that military base. And they had, the peace movement had really detailed plans about housing, about green industry. And this is back in the 80s. They're already talking about green industry, which is pretty cool. Um, you know, local uh I can't even remember all the details, but it was specific. So it was the kind of thing that people could kind of get onto uh, and understand and, and feel confident about and comfortable about. And, and then you can also sort of take that example and you can use it other places too and you know, adapt it to other settings. So um, I think that really that's a lot of, of part of the, you know, the initial steps that we need to be doing is putting more details into talk like just transition uh, it is important to talk about it in a general sense for sure because it's going to require a massive intervention from the state in order to achieve it on the level that we need so that people don't lose their, you know their incomes and they don't lose their house and they don't lose their communities uh, so we do need to talk about it in very you know in, in that general sense but i think we also need to for those specific communities and workers and uh, job sites or workplaces we do need to have be able to pony up some more, you know, some more detail. Again, not in, in sort of a, a naive prescriptive way, but in a, in, a, in a way that helps give those individual workers and their families the, the, the tools, you know, I mean, it, and, and they're gonna develop, develop those tools as well in, 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 as part of that process. It's not just like, you know, walk in and hand them, but to help facilitate that process of identifying what the tools are and what the pathway forward is, I think is, is really a big part of it. Um, you know, and then, and then the last thing would be sort of, I mentioned it, it requires a massive, uh, I think, a massive intervention from the state. Um, and that, of course, raises the question about money and costs and things like that. And, you know, which are 
valid questions for working people to raise. And I think in that, then we, we start to connect with things like um, military spending. Just as an example, and it's bad enough in my country, I know it's far worse in your country, the, the level of military spending, um, but there alone, like there's just, I wrote an article once that said something like, hey, good news, the government found funding for uh, across Canada childcare pro, uh, program for free tuition for, um, you know, uh, housing campaigns for this and this and this bad news, they've already given the money to the Canadian Armed Forces. And so, you know, it's sort of a version of the, uh, it'll be a great day, uh, you know, when the military has to, has to hold a bake sale. And, you know, <laughs> so I think, I think that's the kind of thing that we can do, kind of put more information, more shape to that will help. But I agree, it's a, it's a huge piece of work that we've all got to get together on. And some of the cross-border, uh, I can't remember who said it, but whoever commented on cross-border work, I think that's actually a really important element of this too, you know, where you can sort of say, this isn't just your community and your workplace in my country. And this, you can look at it in, in much more comprehensive terms and share resources, which I think will help move that forward. Yeah. Okay, um, uh, so next one is Yusuf followed by Jean followed by Norma. Uh, thank you. Actually, you sort of addressed some of uh, what I was going to say. Uh, yes, here we do uh, emphasize very much conversion. In fact, in our discussion with the uh, union, sometimes we call it retooling. Uh, so that's sort of even less uh, uh, threatening. It doesn't mean that you know the whole industry is going to go away and replaced with a different industry, but retooling, it's a technical term uh, understood by uh, people in, involved uh, in industry. Uh, and also, uh, I'd like to point out that actually Henry Lohendorf, whom you mentioned, uh, he has done some actual uh, facts and figures that uh, conversion uh, uh, to a, a green piece and to peace industry, a green peace industry would actually be economically beneficial and open up more jobs. And jobs is sort of the perennial argument of the right wing. Apparently, here in Connecticut, the Anti-abolitionist uh, movement uh, you know, found uh, uh, support among uh, cotton workers who they, they feared that abolition of slavery would um, you know, would deprive them of their livelihood. Uh, so, we, but you know what happened is well, a new uh, opportunities were created. Uh, so I, so that's my comment. Uh, and if you have any uh, thing to add, uh, it's my most welcome. That's that's really helpful. That just just the uh, the terminology, you know, retooling. I, I think that's a. I wrote that down. That's really helpful. Thank you, Jean. Yeah. Jean. Well, <clears throat> okay. Thank you very much. And I apologize if I seem to be living life uh, still back in the 90s. But uh, back in those days, there is this book by a fellow named Lester Brown called, Planet, called Plan B, arguing that we don't have Planet B to move to. We have to take care of the one we got. Um, but one of the things he said there was after Pearl Harbor, uh, FDR called all the industrialists of the country together to tell him his war plan. He says, we're going to need uh, 10,000 uh, tanks, we're going to need 100,000 jeeps, we're going to need two more, you know, aircraft carriers and so forth, and listed his demands. And they looked at him and said, Mr. President, you don't understand. We have to build 3 million uh, passenger cars for the American people. And Roosevelt looked at him and said, no, you don't understand. I'm banning the production and sale of passenger cars for the duration. And that's the kind of thing we need at the present time. Somebody will say, I'm banning the production and sale of gas, gas fossil fuels immediately uh, until the planet cools down. 
Um, but they're not likely to do that, I, I think we agree. But the other thing is here in California, uh, we have uh, Peace and Freedom Party. And part of the platform of our, our Peace and Freedom Party is guaranteed jobs at a union wage or a guaranteed income also at a living wage. And this is part of our platform. And of course, uh, uh, Peace and Freedom Party has absolutely no power here in California or anywhere else. But uh, AOC with the Green Deal and so forth is making some similar kinds of comments. And of course, uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, we can trust uh, bourgeois politicians, but that's why we need a dictatorship of the proletariat rather than a dictatorship of the bourgeoisie. But I just wanted to make that comment. And if you care to elaborate on it, uh, I'd be very interested. Just, uh, thank you. That's, um, yeah, I mean, that's exactly, both your comments are, are reflective of discussions that we have uh, in, the, in the Communist Party in Canada. And, and it's not just our party. I mean, there's, there's lots of, of, you know, working class organizations that are having similar types of discussions too. Um, so that decisive, uh, intervention in the economy, which, which, as you, you use the example of FDR, which is a really good one. Uh, there's actually been some writing about that. Um, I think the term Green New Deal is actually been kind of useful because it it harkens, it allows people to look back to a real experience, and they, it's not mythical. You know, it's 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 real. Um, and I think they get a sense of both what decisions need to be taken. Uh, meaning what <laughs> what what demands do we need to advance to politicians, but also um, uh, you know how, how to organize. It tells us like the enormity of that that we really do have to organize around that. So I think that's really important. And then just in terms of uh, it was interesting what you said about the policies of the uh, Peace and Freedom Party because it's very similar to what we have, which is um, uh, in terms of a just transition for in particular for oil sector workers. I mean our party calls for the. Uh, you know, the, basically the closure of the tar sands, um, which would have an incredible impact, both in terms of the environment, but also in terms of jobs, wages, and energy production. Like you can't just call for that. You have to call for more than that, right? You have to call for a just transition. You have to call for alternative sources. You have to call for this and this and this. And so in that context, uh, we, we also say there, there needs to be, you know, the transition needs to include uh, guarantee of jobs, guarantee of income. And, and uh, part of that is the job and the income and the job, but part of that is also bringing in uh, what we call here guaranteed livable income, uh, guaranteed annual livable income, which I think is similar to what you were just describing there. So, um, and, and I'll just finish by saying that, you know, I think again, it, the more that we can sort of uh, craft up those specifics, um, even though, you know, the Peace and Freedom Party, uh, I don't think controls uh, the state of California government and certainly the Communist Party of Canada doesn't uh, control the government here. Um, you know, it's, it's that work of building up the, that that, those agitational uh, narratives and those educational narratives and, and then working on them in an organizational sense to, to engage the, the labor movement and to put the labor movement in touch with the peace movement and the environmental movement. And, all of a sudden you have, you know, uh, much broader voices and much broader movements who are pushing for the same thing. And, and I, that's, as we all know, it's the masses who will make change, you know, that that's what we need to be doing. So really yeah, great and example. We'll return, to this topic. We will return to this topic next week, I'm sure with Tom Gallagher. Okay, so. Gene and um, Dave. So uh, somebody who has not spoken has raised their hand, Richard Fallenbaum. So I'll go to him first, followed by Norma, then followed by Susan. So these are the three in the list. Richard, please go ahead. Well, um, you know, the, the big problem with uh, uh, programs like Just Environment is that um, we're in a situation where the, uh, the, the, the capitalist state is in such deep crisis and there's such... Um, skepticism of the um, efficacy of the bourgeois state, especially, especially in the United States, is that, um, um, and I'm sure in Canada too, that nobody, I don't trust them to 
to to execute any sort of um, 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 just you know and so so you know that we have the sort of paradox of which people are um, the most hostile to the state, voting for the conservative um, 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 uh, politicians who promise not to do anything, basically. And um, um, so I think the only just transition is uh, a socialist revolution. And, um, the, the, you know, other th you know, within the, within the framework of the current system, it's not possible. And I mean, at least, you know, anyway, that's, I, I present that populist view, which is sort of my own. Important for you to respond to that, Dave. <laughs> so that, uh, I'll, 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 I mean, that opens up a really important and, and big topic, there's no question, but um, I think that I'll just say maybe two things if, if it's okay. And one is that uh, I think it relates to the question of the relationship between reform and revolution, right? Which is, you know, uh, that's a bigger debate for sure. And I don't mean to, to you know, guide us in that direction necessarily, but um, I think that is, that is key, right? I mean, what reforms can be won and, and, and in the defense of those reforms, how, how do you move forward to what is really the solution? I think we all agree on that, that the solution is socialism, or at least socialism provides a basis for a solution, maybe is a different way of putting it. Um, and of course, as, as the crisis, the, you know, the environmental crisis is getting worse and worse, but also the economic crisis is getting worse and worse. And so it's, you kind of feel like the timeline for achieving those reforms is becoming shorter and shorter. You know, you, people talk about, they paraphrase Rosa Luxemburg a lot more frequently, capitalism or barbarism. And, and there is a certain scary reality to that. Um, I guess the, uh, and related to that, I suppose, is, is one of the things that we see, and I'm, I'm sure you, you, well, we see it in your country, we see it in our country, we see it in many countries, which is as, as the general crisis generally just continues to deteriorate, economic, environmental, the threat of war, et cetera, we observe that there's people are people are looking for answers, right? And and they're looking more and more to the radical movements for answers. And sometimes they look to the radical left, but sometimes they look to the radical right. And sometimes astonishingly, they look both directions at the same time. So they might pick up this element from the radical left and this element from the radical right. And so you you get people who will talk about, you know, being very anti-corporate, but then they also buy into these horrible, you know, conspiracies around, around, you know, Jewish families controlling the banking industry and stuff like, so there's this kind of com uh, combination of, of far right and, and, and left wing stuff. But I think that that is that is a challenge that we have to face. On the one hand, it's 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 nice to have more people looking to radical alternatives when you're on the receiving end of that interest, but it's really really scary when you see how the radical right is organizing. And and we all know we've all seen images from your country, but in just in the last election that we had here, there were a lot of images from of the radical right organizing across uh, my country and sustaining a new level of 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 far right organizing, which is deliberately confusing to people, and it deliberately feeds off of people's legitimate confusion and, and distress. You know, so it's there is a, it is hard to not feel that there's a, a closing timeline, and and it does make things much more difficult to. Well, I guess I'm agreeing with what you're saying, Richard, in in a, in a slightly different way. So, okay, we have three more people. And we have eight minutes formally remaining. And I'd like Dave to have at least two minutes in the end to say something as a summary if he wants to. So Norma and followed by Susan, followed by Richard Wright. And please. Uh, uh, okay, please I got brief, it. Be brief. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. No, I won't be brief. You know, you can cut me off or something. I suppose you will. Um, the Green New Deal, I suspect, has a, a 
model of how we should be working on our projects. Uh, it's hard to see a copy of the Green New Deal. I think it's under modification constantly, but anyway, <laughs> it is something of being advanced. And along with it, people are organizing a whole heck of a lot and gaining skills, organizational skills and being able to run the, uh, the copy machine and all the other things that are, whatever it is to control processes that can serve our purposes, that can run our governments in our favor, according to the ideas that we are trying to further. Now, according to the ideas that we're trying to, con to further, I'm going to read you what I already have posted on the chat. Uh, in case you're not able to, and, and it has a, it, it's very repetitive to what we've been saying now most of the time since you stopped offering your presentation, Dave. Our work is to validate, affirm with people, bring forward their best, most idealistic objectives. They're often called idealistic but actually the most practical ideas of how to do revolution, of what to work for, because just working to modify the same old is not particularly inspiring for one thing, nor does it promote the solutions beyond what we're already doing, which is working to survive day to day. People who are able to inspire us mainly are people who bring forward our best ideas of our objective, which people are already thinking about, but don't say together because they're so, <laughs> uh, not outrageous, but they're so pushed back in, uh, by school and everything that the institutions we live with. Those people are called charismatic while identifying, educating about what's going on. We need to unite communities in our highest most exciting, most enjoyable ideals and ideas. You know what those ideas are. Say them with us all, structure them with us. The revolution, and this is spoken to everybody, not just any single individual that I'm talking to right now. The revolution is about us dancing and singing. Okay, thank you, Norma. So Susan, you're next. Uh, Dave, you want to react to it or? You just move on. Okay. No, I was just giving my thumbs up. Okay. All right. I agree also with Norma. Radical is going to be the normal. I totally agree. So, uh, Susan. Oh, and no eight-hour day. No yes. eight-hour day. Agree. No. <laughs> okay, Susan. Okay, Richard, thank you for putting Dave's, uh, the link to Dave's article in the chat. I, I was at, wanted to ask for that. Um, I have three things to say, <clears throat> mixed in maybe with a question, but um, the first thing is that there are a lot of people in our movement here who think that climate is the key to building a social, the socialist movement. So that's one point. The second is that the just transition ha has to include community including the indigenous community and other communities that have been damaged by fossil fuel and other industries. And so uh, we try to talk about uh, the just transition for workers and community. And sometimes they're the same people. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is that there is now a, Cal a California jobs plan and I wonder if Dave, you've heard about it because I can, I can send you information. Um, it was prepared by the economist at University of Massachusetts named Robert Pollan, and it's on the web. But if you would put, you put your email- link on to the, Susan, could you put a link onto the chat? I can't right now, but oh. it, I'll, I'll look for it when I stop talking. But it, Dave, would you put your email in the chat? Because I'd like, I'm doing the similar work and I'd like to be in touch with you. Yeah, I have his email, uh, Susan. So okay, I'll, thank you. I'll, I'll look for that link. Okay, thank you. So Richard, you're next and you're the last one. And then I will go to Dave for his final oh, thoughts before we end this up. This is on. probably too, too long to uh, pursue. But uh, uh, 
I noticed that uh, back in uh, before 9-11, there was the, the Teamsters uh, and Turtles moving up to the World, uh, uh, so World um, Trade Forum in Seattle, and which was, which was a beginning uh, uh, expression of, of, of labor and the environment uh, working together. Um, and that has that has seemed to have fallen apart. I was, just, and and this may be too late in the conversation to talk about it. But um, where is that now? Uh, if if you know, thank you. Okay, Dave, your chance to answer that and go go toward your wrap up if you like. <laughs> yeah, so I'll just I won't have a long summary because uh, well you've heard me talk a lot and. Um, I just, uh, just to, I, I, I guess the, the question from from Richard actually is a good jumping off point for a summary because it, it, you know, that's exactly the question that I think of when I think about that, you know, Battle of Seattle. It's like, and where did that go? Like, you know, I, I mean, I know it's not disappeared completely, but it's um, doesn't seem to have developed in in a strong way, and and that's not to to blame any of those organizations. I, I think that's that's just a reality that we have to look at. And I guess that's, um, to me, like, like this is, uh, well, first of all, I really appreciated this discussion. I made lots of notes of the questions and, and comments that uh, you folks uh, uh, had. And I, uh, for me, this is sort of a, a thing that's in, in process. You know, I, I refer to the development of a working class environmentalism. And I guess, um, uh, that's just the way I see it. I'm sure others might see it differently, but that's just the way I see it. And I think that, you know, to pick up on Richard's question, that I think that that's really an example of the kind of of a problem that we have to identify and address. You know, why? How do we get past having, you know, sort of parallel movements, so to speak? Like, well, we have the labor movement, and then allied movements, which are important. It is important to have separate allied movements. There's no question. But the word, how do we get that very intimately integrated into the labor movement so that it's not just a, well, we support this effort. And in, in, sometimes what we see here, what I see here in Canada is that the labor movement sometimes outsources its political work to other coalitions that it supports. It might fund them well, but, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily bring that work in inside and, and make it an organic component of the working class movement. And I think that that's, that's the, I think that's the thing that we, we have to work on. And, and so when I said earlier that I, you know, this wasn't a presentation about the theory because there is theory and the theory is important. There's no question. It's, it's great. But I, I think maybe that, the, the gap that needs to be addressed is a, is a tactical question for me, which is still can be theoretical, of course, but that has to do with how do we describe policies and how do we implement those policies? How do we organize around those policies? How do we, how do we win them and defend them and, and push on with them? And I think, so that's why I, I look at it in those, in those terms. Um, and I think that that's a question that is still going to require a, a, Certainly for me, it's going to require a ton of work. <laughs> so I'll just finish by saying that this, this forum has really uh, helped, you know, it's been helpful for me to think about how to push forward with this stuff. And I, and I, I put my, uh, my email in the chat there. Uh, Raj has it as well. And I'd encourage you to feel free to, to send me information if you want. I'd be very happy to hear from, from any and all of you. Um, and I'll do my very best to get back to you. In, in a timely way, sometimes I uh, <laughs> sometimes I get bogged down and I can't. But I really I, I do invite and encourage you to to send me information, and I'd be very happy to try and maintain. You know, I've appreciated the connections we've made here, and I'd be very happy to maintain and build on those as much as we can because I think this is a key part of our joint work for socialism and, and liberation. So thank you all very very much. Thank you, Dave. Uh, very stimulating. Very. Uh, good conversation, very good talk. And I feel very excited because I'm concerned about both the working class as well as environment and the two have to be, I mean, in some ways it's a challenge the Bolsheviks faced in their time about peasants and about oppressed yeah. people. 
So indigenous community are the oppressed people and there are others, you know, the uh, African-Americans in the United States, lower caste in India, so forth. So those are the challenge for the Communist Party's job is to integrate and put policies together uh, or, or, or advance slogans and demands that under capitalism can only be partially met. And, and because people are gonna be angry and only revolutions happen only when people cannot live like they used to be able to live, which we are approaching. And the governments cannot rule like they used to be able. This is Lenin saying, not me. And I think we, approach, we have already approached that in the United States. And even though threat of fascism there, but fascism has really nothing to offer to the people. And so fascism could be very dangerous, destructive, but ultimately fascism is defeated. And, and therefore, really, I'm very encouraged by you joining us today. And it's very exciting. You're welcome here, uh, comrade. Whenever you want to come to the Bay Area, you will have a home here. So uh, with that, formal part is over. I'll stop the recording, but informal discussion will continue. And Dave, we invite you to stay on if you can afford the time. And another half an hour at one o'clock, we'll It'd be a hard, uh, hard turn off of the program. Uh, <laughs> okay. we'll turn it off. Okay. So we're canceling the uh, okay, recording. Well, thank you, Dave. This was excellent. And thank you, Raj, for organizing it and moderating. It was excellent yeah. program. Thank you, Gene. You. You're, you're the inspiration behind all this. <laughs>